right. And uh, one thing I'll say at the outset is that, you know, uh, I'm not an expert in economics. I'm just sort of a lay person who's interested in these things. And I'm also not coming into this conversation with a particularly strong perspective in any direction. This is just a truth seeking mission. Um, these are these are questions that I'm interested in. And I am just genuinely curious what you think about them. And so, um, yeah, uh, what, what I want to start by asking is just a very, very broad question. And then I want to get into a more specific question. The broad question is simply, what do you think the state should do? Well, my view is, is it, it, you have to ask the question, why do we have a state? What's, what's the purpose of the state? Why do individuals need a state? And I would argue they do. I'm not an anarchist. Um, but I think you have to understand kind of uh, the moral foundation of the, of, of the moral purpose of a state. And, and I think we have to start with the fact that from my perspective, the moral purpose of a human being is to live the best life that he can, to live a moral life, to live a happy life. Um, and that requires certain things. And, and more than anything else, it requires that a human being be able to think for himself to use his mind freely, to come to whatever conclusions he comes to, and to act on those conclusions. And that that requires freedom. That requires the ability to, 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 to think, to express oneself, uh, free speech, for example, and then to act on those thoughts. And I think that, that uh, you know, in the 18th century, they came up with a concept to, in a sense, capture this idea of freedom. Uh, this idea of the freedom of the individual to live his life as he sees fit. And that is the idea of rights, of individual rights, the kind of the, the Lockean notion of rights. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think individuals have, uh, have rights as a, moral, uh, as a moral necessity so that they can live their lives to the best of their ability. And the right really means that you have, you have the, the, the freedom of action to pursue your rational values, um, uh, free of coercion, free of interference, free of fraud, free of, uh, of authority, authority that impose their will on you. And again, this comes from the experience in Europe of authorities, the church, the state, uh, authorities that dictate to people how to live, what profession to have, you know, who they could marry, uh, and, and, uh, and what discoveries were acceptable and what discoveries were not acceptable. And the so, state, oh, so, the, sorry. so the state, therefore, is the guarantor of that right, of those rights. So the state, therefore, sole purpose is the protection of those rights. So the state is there to protect you from the fact that when we come into society as individuals, we now are exposed to people who might want to impose their will on us, might want to defraud us, might want to use violence against us. Uh, maybe that's, and, and typically that's only a minority of people, but it's still a significant minority and force is a significant uh, uh, you know, is, is a major deterrent to thinking and acting. So the role of the state is to protect us from force. And it's to help define or, or, or uh, define in legal terms uh, objective means to decide who initiated force and who didn't. This is not necessarily an easy thing. To objectively define what are the boundaries of property rights and when are they infringed and when are they not? And property rights are complicated and certainly in the internet age, they've only become in a sense more complicated. So that is the role of the state. It's to, it's to help define these boundaries and, and procedures and then to, to, to enforce them, to protect, to protect our rights. So police, military, judiciary, that's it. Protection from, uh, from uh, obviously violence and fraud and theft and all of, all of those kind of uh, criminal offenses, but otherwise, and, and to arbitrate disputes. If the two of us have a contractual dispute, mm -hmm. um, one option could be for the state to, to, to arbitrate that contractual dispute based on the principles of property rights. Okay, so you're not an anarchist. You believe there should be a state. The things the state should do include um, they should make it, the state should make it legal for people to acquire private property, to inherit it. Um, well, I see it reversed, right? They're not making it legal. They're recognizing your legal right. right to your property. They're not making right. it legal, but they're helping define what it means to own property. Right. Okay. It's not always straightforward. Okay. So they're recognizing an inalienable right to private property. Yes. Um, to, to acquire it, to inherit it, 
et cetera. Um, uh, in, in your ideal society, murder would be illegal. Theft would be illegal. There would be a police force um, to prevent those things, interpersonal violence, theft, et cetera. Um, I think you also think there should be an army for national defense. Definitely. Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, and it, it was interesting you mentioned fraud because fraud, on what, what is the principled argument for having a state um, prevent person X from committing fraud against person Y? So because fraud, I'm in a sense, I view fraud as violence. Fraud is a way of, achieve, of, of gaining, um, gaining a value from you without your consent. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Because your, your consent is undermined by the fact that I'm lying to you. So, uh, so to the extent that I gain a value from you without your consent, that is a form of violence. Oh, interesting. Oh. Okay, gotcha. Okay, and um, and again, it's not easy to define, right? Yeah. Exactly. And that's you need legal philosophers, you need a legislature, mm -hmm. you need laws that clearly articulate what is fraud and what isn't fraud, what is, you know, what is just advertising versus what is fraud, right? Because you could have advertising that's, you know, hyping versus what is fraud. The, the two things are not the same. But that's, it's not obvious. I don't have an answer to every one of the borderline questions. Do you consider abortion um, a form of interpersonal violence or no. not? No. no. Okay. So there's, you, no so you, there's no person. There's a, there's a, there's a, a, a living, a living being, but it's not a person. It's not an individual human beings and, and rights can only apply to individuated human beings. You're only getting rights once you're born. Once you're born. outside of the womb, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so two other specific questions about state function. Okay, well, actually three. So one regarding, so how, how in your ideal system would the revenue be generated? Um, in an ideal system, to some extent, it's hard to tell, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of time to think about this. But I'd say primarily through voluntary means. I think uh, voluntary oh. contributions to government uh, in support of the police and the military. I mean, I, I, I have no doubt that, my, my challenge would be that the government would have too much money, not too little. Also, you could imagine certain revenue, um, certain things that the government could do that would generate revenue. For example, um, if, if the two of us had a contract, and we could have in the contract private arbitration and pri private mediation and arbitration, but if we wanted the final authority to be the state, that is government courts, if we wanted that, that to be the final authority, we would, let's say, have to pay a fee to the court system in order to be the final guarantor of the contract. And that would fund the courts because think about some of the big contracts that corporations sign with each other. Um, it, I think patent offices, copyright offices would generate significant significant revenue. I think, I think there are a number of things, that, ways in which you could generate revenue for certain services that are provided. Mm -hmm. But I think that the bulk, particularly for the military, things like the military would have to come voluntarily. And I think one of the, advantages of that is um, the state would have a very hard time engaging in war mm -hmm. unless it was popular, right? And, and they would have to convince the people that it was popular because otherwise people would hold funding. They, you know, and even if you think about even World War One and Two, which certainly one, I think, was one of the dumbest wars in history, certainly for the United States to intervene, but um, they had to sell war bonds and, and uh, they made out, it was a whole campaign to sell war bonds. And they made an effort. Today they go to war. They don't care. I mean, they, they just run deficits or whatever, and they, they just go to war. There's no consideration of how it's going to be funded and convincing people of the just, the justness of the war. So, um, and just hypothetically speaking, if voluntary contributions weren't sufficient to prop up a, a sufficiently strong police force and army and court system, et cetera. Then, then the people will get the society they deserve. Gotcha. Okay. So you, so you, you have an absolute opposition to taxation, like forced taxation. Forced taxation, absolutely. And and uh, you know, again, it, when we get to when we get to everybody paying five percent flat rate uh, across the board, and and a bunch of taxes are zero, uh, you know, that'll be a great day. I'll I'll be celebrating. <laughs> right. right. Exactly. Um, it won't be so, perfect, but it'll be a lot better than the current situation. Exactly. But I do yeah. think that the perfect system and the ultimately the system that 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 is sustainable. Because yeah. I think a 5% tax is not sustainable. It, it, you know, first income tax was 7%. Only on the top 5% of owners, I think. And it very quickly, yeah. as a, because of World War One, 
became a tax on everybody and, and tax rates went through the roof very, very quickly. So once you establish the precedent, there's no limit to it. You need to get rid of the precedent. Um, so, so yes, I, I, I think that voluntary taxation, I'm against coercion. Mm-hmm. So I'm against coercion, even if it's done by a majority. Right. I'm, I'm, you know, so it's, yep. it's democracy doesn't um, legitimize coercion. Uh, this may be too specific a question to merit much interest, but it, what's the tax situation in Puerto Rico? It's How complex because uh, because Puerto Ricans are taxed in one way and uh, there's a special tax um, uh, regime for people moving to Puerto Rico from the United States. Ah. Um, and uh, so I pay a lot less than Puerto Ricans do. They, they and it, nobody in Puerto Rico pays federal taxes, mm-hmm. so uh, no taxation without representation. Since Puerto Rico is not <laughs> represented, then they don't get taxed. But uh, from a state tax perspective, there's a, a massive um, uh, incentive for people who move into Puerto Rico from the United States. And so that played a role in your going. Yes. No oh, I see. Um, okay, so a couple of other questions about func- proper functions of the state, and then we'll proceed to some more practical issues. Um, so what about um, monopoly prevention? Do you think that that is a proper function of the state? No, and, and, no, and, and part of the issue is um, that there are no monopolies in a, in a truly capitalist society. Mm. Um, monopoly is a creation of government. Uh, monopolies, you know, it, the word comes from... Uh, you know, the term was first used by a, a king granting you a monopoly to do trade with India, right? And you get the East India Company, and only you can do trade with India. Nobody can compete with you. That's where the term comes from. And monopolies are the post office is a monopoly on first class mail. If you try to compete with them, you go to jail. There is no other monopoly. So you could argue. So some economists, I question how you know, uh, economically minded, they really are. But some economists argue that, you know, uh, uh, market power Mm -hmm. is is monopoly power, but that's nonsense. And there's no examples of it in history, not in a, in a, in a, in a, in a semi even free market. So take, for example, um, standard oil in the 1870s had 93% of the refining capacity in the United States, 93%. Wow. That sounds like a monopoly, right? Sounds like nobody can compete with them. But what do economists tell us that the behavior of a monopolist is? A monopolist who has 93% drives up prices and drives down quality. Mm-hmm. And yet, unequivocally, prices went down during the 1870s, 80s, 90s, teens. Um, prices went down and quality went up dramatically, not even by small amounts, dramatically. Because Rockefeller understood that in a free market, since he didn't have a government protection, a competitors would arise as soon as he slipped. Mm. And he constantly mm. drove for efficiency. So why do we care? You know, Google arguably has a market dominant position in um, advertising, right? Online. Why does anybody care? Right? Google is free to all of us. So uh, yeah. So no so one, this really this no really becomes. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this, I'm saying so this really example, right? Of of this actually happening mm. because. There's always competition. And let me just finish the Standard Oil example in L. Of course, of course. Um, Two things. One, by the time Standard Oil was broken up, I think it was in the 1920s, um, it only had 20, I think, 3% of the oil refining capacity in the United States. So over the 50 years, its oil refining capacity shrunk in terms of percentage in the U.S., not because of government, not because of antitrust, but because of competition. Mm. Other people figured out how to compete with them. And second... The primary use for, for oil for oil refining in the in the 1870s was for kerosene, for lighting. Right. Who landed up competing them out of that business? I mean, completely out of that business. Well, Thomas Edison and right. Nikola Tesla, with uh, you know, with electricity. So, uh, which which antitrust official in the government would have predicted in the 1870s that no, no, it's it, this monopoly is short lived because. You know, Edison is going to come around and, and completely, you know, destroy uh, the lighting industry. And, and for for uh, for uh, nobody, can, nobody could have predicted that. And, and uh, certainly not a government bureaucrat. So, no, I, I you know, if you look at Alcoa uh, and the antitrust lawsuit against them, when they had like 80 something percent of all the aluminum production, um, prices were going down, quality was going up. If you look at IBM, 
being an uh, antitrust case for, for mainframes, and yet digital was producing mini computers, mini mainframes, and then within a decade, you had personal computers that completely blew that business up, right? And, and it, on the other side of IBM, there were supercomputers who were competing with them. So they're always, you know, I forget the name of the supercomputer company that was producing supercomputers in those days, but there's always competition. And, you know, even if you, the bureaucrat, can't see it, Mm. It's there, and the venture capitalists just eager to fund it, because uh, because if you've gained eighty seven percent or ninety percent of a market, there's 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 probably opportunities to compete against you. Right. So you would say, like your your main response to the often made claim, even among fairly libertarian types, that the state is necessary for monopoly prevention. Your response to that is that these people are conflating market power with monopoly power. Well, generally, we have a culture that conflates what we call uh, market power with political power. Political power mm -hmm. is the power of the gun. Political yeah. power is the government of, uh, is the power of coercion. Economic power is the power of success. Is the power of voluntary trade. Uh, if we don't like Microsoft's so-called monopoly, we can stop buying Microsoft products, and they're always substitutes. Think about Linux. Think about, of course, Apple. But but they're always going to substitute. They might not be convenient substitutes. But, but you don't have a right to convenience, right? And, and here's the fundamental point. The fundamental point is the state has no role to engage in coercive power over anybody. Yeah. Certainly not successful people, right? If you're successful, you get penalized. That makes no sense. Last question on state functions. Um, how would infrastructure be developed? In your well, this, ideal yeah, the same way it was developed originally in the United States through private mm -hmm. actions. So the first canals were built by private actors. Uh, the, the first ferries were private. The first um, roads were actually privatized. And then, and then government capital flew in and, and drove out private capital. So uh, the better railroads were built. Uh, so if, if you look at the the, the main railroad was at the, the Atlantic Pacific Railroad that was built um, uh, during the Civil War was a pathetic endeavor that never made money and, and was filled with problems and breakdowns and, and, and was not efficient. But the, the one that went north from Chicago through, uh, uh, across to Seattle was incredibly profitable, incredibly successful, and, 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 and uh, very well managed. And it was funded 100% by private capital. So, um, you know, the, the government, when it builds infrastructure, tends to uh, take away private property. It tends to violate property rights. Uh, and, uh, and who knows what would happen. Now, uh, I think one of the reasons we got the uh, interstate highway system in the 1950s is because government had already destroyed the railroads. I mean, uh, through regulation. Imagine if railroads had been truly private and been allowed to thrive. Why, why does some of these other states have high-speed rail and we don't? Well, because we took out all the incentives from railroads to develop, and then we destroyed the business by creating this, the, the highway system. Um, so, and of course, highways have lots of trucks on them. Why are trucks on highways? You'd mm -hmm. think those would be much more efficiently uh, uh, moved yeah. around by trains. Again, because government destroyed through regulation, really going back to the 1870s, 60s and 70s, uh, the, the whole rail industry. And there's a lot of documentation of economic historians looking at, the, at how government, government did that. And if someone said to you, well, if private companies take responsibility for infrastructure, they're only going to do it if they can make a profit. The only way they're going to make a profit is if they obviously charge people for a lot of the infrastructure that today is free. For example, driving on interstates. Would part of your response be that you're paying for it with your tax dollars. Um, yeah, and, and why, you know, if I don't drive, you know, some, let's say poor people who you use public transportation today and, and struggle, particularly in places like California, yet to the extent that they pay taxes, they're paying for the highway system. Why? They're not using it, right? Yeah. So um, I would yeah. say it's great, right? It, it, it pay for use, right? Let's have everything told. And today, tolls are costless in the sense that, uh you put a you put a little track on your car and An easy you get a bill. Yeah. You could you could you could tow road every road in the United States, yeah. and through GPS technology, you could just get a bill at the end for the different owners of the different roads. So there are a variety of different ways to do that. Um, but again, the principle the principle is yeah. I mean, 
uh, some people would toll the roads, but in an age without the convenience that we have today, a lot of people would build roads without tolling them. And, and that happens. For example, I lived in a gated community in California. There was a, there was a nice road led the, leading to that gated community because it was a little removed from the rest of, of civilization, if you will. Um, well, the developer had an enormous incentive to build that road and not to toll it. And uh, because, oh, uh, yeah. because mm -hmm. you have access to the neighborhood. Right. And I had a huge incentive to pay a little bit, a bit of money in my community fees to support that road so that people could get to me, right? Mm -hmm. And for me mm -hmm. to be able to get to places. Um, business owners uh, who, who, who have stores or malls along a highway stretch certainly have an incentive to pay for the maintenance of that road and maybe to make it free. So maybe they pay the developer or the owner of the road. Here's a lump sum. Don't charge a toll because we want a lot of people to drive here because then they see them all and they come and visit me in the mall or mm -hmm. my restaurant or whatever it is. So the market is super, and you know, and this is just me off the top of my head. Yeah. The market is super inventive right? in terms of solutions to these kind of problems. We haven't allowed the market to develop because the state has basically, I mean, 70% of all the land west of the Mississippi is owned by a state entity, whether it's local, uh, state or federal. So we haven't had any opportunity to develop uh, uh, private infrastructure except in gated communities. Uh, and it's it, infrastructure that tends to be much better than- Yeah, gated smart. communities are really nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm in. I'm uh, vacationing in uh, in kind of the Jupiter, Florida area, and I've been in a number of gated communities, just driving around, and it's incredibly nice. Yeah, Makes and, me want and to move that's here. because they're funded privately, yeah. and they take care of the roads because they use them, they own them, they care for them. Um, and uh, roads in Puerto Rico are, are, are just a complete and utter disaster, and that's because it's all dependent on a pretty corrupt state, uh, yeah. and and. Uh, and, and you see that across the board. And why isn't there, why isn't there a solution to traffic congestion in, uh, in California? Well, because nobody has an incentive to solve the problem. But imagine if you could make money solving the problem um, and you, you didn't have to go through the state in order to do it. You, you'd, there'd be tunnels. There'd be, I mean, people would come up with ideas that we can't e even imagine today. Elon Musk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that tunneling technology Elon Musk has should be the mechanism by which we solve the congestion problem in LA. But instead we build, you know, I don't know, bicycle lanes and, and bus <laughs> lanes, which, which only make traffic worse, not better. Okay. So, um, so shifting now. So the reason, the main reason I wanted to talk is that, you know, I generally describe myself as a proponent of free markets. I believe that capitalist culture and institutions um, are responsible for the incredible advancements and in quality of life over the last one to 200 years. So that is my view. I consider myself a proponent of limited government, but when people ask me, uh, you know, do I think that the state should play a role in the economy under certain circumstances, I do tend to make the following argument. And I'm pretty sure you disagree with it, and I'm open-minded on this subject. I'm certainly not doctrinaire about it, um, but you know, my current view, I think, is different from yours, and I want to understand what you would say in response to this point of view. So let me just lay it out in like three to four minutes, and then you can respond. So um, for the last few years, I've been saying to people in conversations about this that even though states rarely succeed in fostering innovation and in turbocharging complex industrialization, states can be extremely useful and may even be critical for achieving these objectives, particularly if the goal is to achieve them quickly. Um, and the basic argument here is that private firms have fewer resources than states and they have to be profitable, unlike states. Having fewer resources than states and needing to be profitable, unlike states, means that private firms are less likely to have enough resources or enough appetite for risk to make the investments necessary to develop highly expensive technologies that may take decades to become marketable, like aircraft, rockets, the internet. Mm -hmm. um, states also don't have enough resources to make the initial investments necessary to get really complex industries going, steel, cars, ships, electronics, computers, and to protect them and nurture them in their infant, 
in their infancy. Um, so for these reasons, I've heard it said that the state is necessary for the development of technologies, but that the, uh, or let me say that again. I've heard it said that the state is uh, necessary for developing technologies and that the private sector is really good at commercializing them. Uh, one other point that I'll make uh, in this regard is that states also at times have really powerful incentives to develop technologies and industries unlike any, in unlike any incentives that companies might have. And I'm talking about total war. I'm talking about existential conflict. Total wars provide states with an unparalleled incentive, an existential incentive to develop and improve technologies because if they don't, they're gonna get destroyed. And it's remarkable in this connection to think about how many major technologies in the 20th century in the United States originated or rapidly advanced during World War II, whether it's aircrafts or semiconductors. Now, I want to immediately qualify this by saying, admittedly, in many countries, it might be impossible for the state to drive innovation or to nurture successful industries of the future. The state might be too corrupt. The society may not have sufficient human capital so that state investment is relevant. Sure. But if the state is not too corrupt, and if there is sufficient human capital, state action may be the only way to innovate and to become competitive in complex sectors, or at least to do so relatively quickly. And the two main examples that I have in mind when I think about these arguments are the US in the 20th century. I think that's a good example of state investments, particularly Pentagon funding being necessary for hugely important innovations in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and then the East Asian tigers, South Korea and Taiwan, and to some extent China, uh, are good examples, I think, of state investments being necessary for the creation of really successful competitive companies in complex sectors of the economy like steel, shipbuilding, cars, electronics, computers, where these countries, if they had just done what they had comparative advantage in, they may never have uh, developed these sectors, and they certainly wouldn't have done so as quickly as they did. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there, but so, so, so again, um, I'm generally a proponent of free markets, but it does seem to me that the state has played a really important role in developing innovative technologies, particularly, for example, in the United States in the 20th century, and in turbocharging a complex industrialization process, as has been seen in the case of East Asian tigers in the last 50 to 75 years. So what do you say to that? Yeah, so so this is a this is a pretty common argument among economists and um, and among um, proponents of of you know, the, the, I'd say the better proponents of a limited government who think government should intervene in basic science and certain uh, issues around technology. I, 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 you know, I think it's, I think it's wrong. I, I think it's, again, I, I'll start with the moral point, with the philosophical point. Mm -hmm. And that is, even if everything you said was true, which I don't think it is, but, uh, and we'll get to that, but even if that were true, then I'd still be against it because, so progress will be slower. So technology will take longer. Um, I don't. I certainly don't think you use the word necessary a number of times. I don't think any of that is necessary, right? Mm -hmm. I, there's no proof of that, and I'll give some counter examples. Um, but the much more fundamental point is uh, the state has to uh, take money from some people to give to others. That I think is morally offensive and morally wrong. It then allocates it based on priorities that have nothing to do long-term, I think, with human well-being, even in the best-run states. Uh, we can focus on the, I don't know the exact percentage, and nobody's done the research that I know of, of the exact percentage, on the success stories. And we ignore the failures, uh, probably 90% of the investments. All the research grants that went to nothing, because, and we don't know because <laughs> we don't know them, right? Um, some you can see the white elephant petrochemical and drug industry investment the Japanese government tried to steer the economy towards and you can travel through Japan and see the massive plants that sit empty today uh, because because what we know is the industries were successful we we forget about the stuff that wasn't and we don't have a counterfactual right we don't have the alternative um, so so you know, we now have philosopher kings deciding what technology is going to be good and what isn't, who among scientists should be invested in and who shouldn't. I think that while, again, we see the successes, what we don't see 
Uh, the things that might have gotten funded under a different system that didn't for political reasons. Uh, what about all the stem cell stuff that could have happened if not for Republicans uh, under Bush and others uh, stopping it? What about all the nuclear technology that would have evolved if not for the state stopping it? You know, um, if the state is going to fund science, the state's going to regulate science. Um, what about the fact that it's probably likely that if I do a, if I get a government grant and my results of my study are, you know what, the world is doing great. Things are fantastic. Don't do anything. I probably will never get another grant. But if my results of my study are, the world's going to end in 20 years unless we do X, Y, Z. I need another grant to study how to do X, Y, Z effectively. I'm, I probably guaranteed myself a lifetime of funding, right? And, and I take, I take um, uh, climate change as an example. And maybe COVID, you know, maybe you could argue some of the stuff in COVID is related to government funding of science and, and the incentive that is associated with that. So I am very skeptical about government funded science. Uh, it's true that if you give hundreds of scientists money, thousands of scientists money, which is what the government does, grants to thousands of scientists, a few of them will do major things that will have import and we will all identify, yes, you know, the woman who single-handedly basically drove mRNA technology, right? Just, she was a bulldog. She's a, she's a Romanian immigrant to the United States, I worked at the University of Pennsylvania for a while, and she just wrote grant application after grant. Most of them were turned down, but she was just a bulldog. She just stuck with it and she got it. We got a vaccine. Now you could say the government did it because they funded her. Yeah, but what about all the grants she didn't get? Maybe we could have you know, saved 20 years on this. I mean, who knows? Hmm. But the point is, yes, if you, if you diversify enough, which is what government does, uh, some of it will succeed. The mRNA technology will succeed. What about the, the, the thousands of scientific grants that were given to people who found no results? Or here's one other, one other example that just came to me. What about all the research into um, that the government funded, government promoted, and then the government supported into, for example, uh, health? So, for example, what we should eat. You know the government food pyramid? Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> there's major, major evidence it's wrong, right? It's, it's just wrong. It's not good for you. And it maybe it's, it's the cause of the obesity crisis, right? Because it emphasizes simple carbs and sugar and things like that. And fat, you know, for a variety of reasons, fat might not be that bad for you, particularly in comparison to things like sugar. Um, all government-driven sci government science, all a disaster, maybe have caused massive obesity in this country, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, massive amounts of, of uh, diabetes and heart disease and so on. Do we weigh the costs of that versus the benefit that we attribute to all the other stuff? I'm not, I'm not convinced that if you weighed that properly, you would get a positive outcome. Okay, now to some of the specifics. Um, so with regard to government development of technology and its role in developed technology, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a website that I think you know, it's just, it's just a, an amazing resource and uh, uh, provide a lot of, and it's not necessarily disagreeing with you, but it, it, uh, for, for those arguing for the extreme, just all government driven and everything, this guy really presents some great arguments and he goes through the books and he, so this is called, his name is, he, he, it's Nintil, N-I-N-T-I-L.com, N-I-N-T-I-L.com. He's Spanish, so you have to, uh, you have to, put on translate, but the translations are really good um, for his, art, his articles. But um, this guy is just brilliant in my view. I mean, he went through the entrepreneurial state, that, that book by, I forget her name, and he goes section, he goes pretty much paragraph by paragraph and, and questions. And he goes to the original research. So he goes to sources, right? So she will cite something, he'll go to the citation and show what's really going on. Anyway, um, this is the conclusion he came to about war, because he has a whole thing about the Air Force, about, uh, about the idea of, of uh, here are two things that he cites. Uh, first, he says, most economic historians, including, for example, uh, an economist by the name of Joel McCoy, M-O-K-Y-R, 
assess the effects of war on technological innovation as largely negative, with a few exceptions, right? Oh, with the exceptions of economists, but most economists, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the reason of the above is that war encourages a conservative approach to technology, inducing demand for existing technology. Thus, most war technology was developed prior to the war. Uh, third point, the more developed a technology is, the harder for spin-offs spin of military technology to be successful. Uh, four, more research is required, uh, understanding the effects of military R&D, uh, but, but, but that whole research is plagued with difficulties. There's, there's real difficulties in assessing that. So it seems like most economic historians, and I haven't studied the literature thoroughly, mm -hmm. actually think technology innovation. And for example, World War II. Uh, one of the things that World War II did very well is leverage Bell, Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. And what it, what it went to Bell Labs, and, and it leveraged some British, uh, some British scientists. But what they did is they basically went to Bell Labs and, and basically accelerated the development of existing technologies or technologies that were being speculated on. And now there was funding to go full throttle. And, and there's no question that happened and that accelerated it. Uh, I don't think that's true of, the, of, of, uh, of ultimately the semiconductor, but certainly some of the other technologies, the semiconductor really did come out of Bell Labs. Um, and you could argue about Bell Labs, is it a pure, is it a lab that was really private because it was protected in a sense by AT&T's monopoly power that was granted by government. So a, a real monopoly in the sense that government granted it. Uh, but, but there were other, other uh, 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 corporate labs and other uh, private research labs. Um, he also makes the point about aircraft because there's a lot, there's a book about, right? And he, he reviews the book that says aircraft development could have happened if not for. Uh, so this is what he writes about this, which I, th I thought, what would a counterfactual look like? He says to the whole uh, question. Imagine no world wars, no air mail subsidies, no NACA, which I guess was, a, was, a, was an entity that, that the government ran. Um, Scientists working for NACA would be elsewhere. Without military pressure for NACA, Galset, and other Guggenheim-funded uh, uh, or other Guggenheim-funded colleges, would have taken the throne. So other Guggenheim-funded colleges would have taken the throne of top aircraft research centers. Aircraft manufacturing would have remained low as research advanced. Eventually, advances in this technology, perhaps even funded by manufacturers would have enabled the construction of profitable aircraft. Following the same route, jet engines would have been integrated at some point. So I'm willing to grant that the government support was very important and that it could have accelerated the pace of development. But the mass manufacturing of aircraft for the war did not. I thus conclude here that war was not necessary for the appearance and growth of an aircraft industry, but that it could have accelerated it, could have accelerated uh, government isn't an ex uh, NACA, which is the one entity he cites here, isn't an example of state entrepreneurship, as apparently the ones pushing for the case for NACA forward were the Aeronautical Society, who just wanted to see more progress in things they liked. And the initial reaction of government officials wasn't very appreciative. That is, there was a lot of resistance uh, from government, as you'd expect. Um, so on every one of these technologies, what is the counterfactual? So, and, and here, I think he undermines the, I mean, the kind of factual is much larger, right? What happens if we're not taxing people at 50% of their income? What happens if we're not taking, uh, you know, 20 something percent of corporate mm. profits? What happens if private, if government is not crowding out? And we know the crowding out effect, well documented in economics. What happens if government is not crowding out private entrepreneurs, private businesses, private philanthropists from investing in science and technology. Um, I, I can guess, I don't have the parallel universe in which it's happening, but we know that private, that private entrepreneurs are interested in science, for example. We know that billionaires, well, imagine if a billion, if there are more billionaires, because under capitalism, I believe there'll be many more billionaires, right? Standard of living would be much higher, partially because I think they would be funding science and they would be funding more science more effectively. The grant system, science grant system in the United States is broken. It is ineffectual. Even people in the, the, that associate with the state funding of know this. Uh, for example, one just little observation. It used to be 
that young scientists got the majority of the grants. Today, it's old scientists get the majority of the grants. Yet innovation is almost, not exclusively, but almost exclusively a young person's game. Think of the big breakthroughs of Einstein. Almost all of them came when he was very young. It's, you know, it just is. It's, it's, true, in, uh, it's true in almost every field that, that uh, particularly thinking outside of the box and thinking new and breaking out of the box is, is, is something, a phenomena of, of younger people. Um, so, you know, just fixing that would probably change the pace of innovation. And yet one could imagine the private entrepreneurs, private businesses would, would be much more oriented towards success much more oriented towards result orientation, much more, just like I think charity would be much more effective at helping the poor than welfare, because I think people who gave to charity would be much more interested in results than the welfare state, which I don't think is that interested in results. Um, so the whole incentive, the whole motivation, everything about funding of science would be different. Now, would some things that develop slower? Yes. Would some things that develop faster? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, the whole landscape of technology would be different mm -hmm. but would it be different in a negative way i very much doubt it and let me add one last point look wars happen um i don't deny the need for for defense department i don't deny the need for defense department to fund certain types of technology that help defend the state um that would orient technologies in a particular way whether that from an economic perspective is the best way to orient technologies, probably not, but it's a necessary way in order to facilitate defense, right? So the defense department would, would fund certain projects, even if they were not optimal, they would fund them because they need them in order to defend. So yeah, some developments would happen because of the state, some technologies would advance. And again, it, it might even be suboptimal. But I would be for it because I think a defense department has to stay on top of these things and make sure that it can defend the country. Um, so that that would be my answer. Yeah, that's actually really helpful for me because I think the main thing that you're offering in this conversation that I haven't really done in my own thinking about this is when someone says the state is necessary for the development of highly innovative technologies or the development of really complex industries from scratch in a generation or two. I, I think the, the move you make in the argument is to say, well, compared to what? Like, right? And so, um, it, so I don't think you dispute that as a matter of fact, in the last 100 to 150 years, a lot of technologies and industries have been, uh, have depended on high levels of state investment. Well, I would limit that to about, about 70 years because I don't think that's okay. true beyond 70 years. Okay, fair enough. For, for, for the last 70 years. But okay. but I think, but but what you're saying, I think is, but let's imagine a world in which the state is radically limited in what it does and all of this capital is in private hands. First of all, you're saying there would be more capital yeah. <laughs> because there would be more wealth. Um, and, and then a lot of that would be allocated toward the development of, innovative technologies and industries. And who's to say that that very distant alternative universe would not, uh, would not birth a much more innovative, industrially interesting and advanced society than the one I mean, we currently inhabit. I mean, so, look how much universities raise today for buildings, for dorms, for all kinds of things. Um, Imagine if they needed to raise money for research. Um, I mean, they raise a lot today, but they could raise 10x, 100x if government wasn't crowding out that the, the funding and if entrepreneurs and, and the society generally had more. I mean, I would, be, I would be delighted to fund basic research into an area that I particularly liked or, right. or, or, or was, was enthusiastic about. But it, and, and that's true of, think about Elon Musk and, and, and Jeff Bezos wanting to go to Mars. I mean, wouldn't they be funding technology and funding science, basic science that would make that possible. So I think that's all. But let me let me present one counterfactual that also relates to that, that actually existed, that also relates to developing countries, right? And that counterfactual is the 19th century. Arguably, the century with the most innovations, biggest innovations that changed human life more than any other, right? The state was not involved in electricity. Uh, the state was not involved in, it was involved in railroads in the US, less so in Britain, uh, but but only to, I think, the detriment of railroad development, not to its, uh, its advantage. 
uh, but they weren't involved in the steam engine. They weren't involved in the massive innovation. So if you look at government spending on R&D and basic science and technology up until World War II, it's as close to zero as it can be. And yet, if you think about the big stuff, the things that really changed our lives, from medical discoveries to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to electricity, to uh, uh, everything we have today, that's the era. You mentioned steel industry. Well, the steel industry was not funded by the government. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the government tries to interfere because when they try to consolidate the steel industry to create a, quote, so-called monopoly, uh, the steel trust, the government ultimately tried to break it up. But yeah, I mean, th that all happened organically, naturally, without any intervention. We got a steel industry. We got all kinds of industries at the beginning, at the late 19th century, early 20th century, that really drove everything we have in the 20th century. Now, yes, we got some additional innovations in the 20th century, but much of that, if you study Bell Labs, the amount of innovation that came out of Bell Labs is unbelievable. It's, it's phenomenal. Then, I mean, the whole idea that the internet was created by government and all, the, all of these technologies, I really encourage you and people to look at Nintel's mm. detailed, right? Yeah, I will they definitely check that out. Blog posts analyzing this. <laughs> he admits that sure, they had some uh, effect, but it's way overstated and way, uh, you know, it's become kind of popular law but it's just untrue with regard to most of these things. And it's a comp, what happened, it's a complex interplay of university scientists. Are we arguing that there wouldn't be university scientists without the government? I, I wouldn't argue that. With some government funding, with some de de Department of Defense uh, uh, projects, with private entrepreneurs, private research labs, and venture capitalists, it's a complex interplay of all of those. Uh, you you know, and, and it's not true even that, that the private enterprise is only good at application. They were involved in some of the basic mm -hmm. research. So it's a, it's a complex interplay of these things. Um, so let's take, let's take uh, the Asian tigers. Yeah, and by the way, when I mentioned steel, I was talking about the Asian tigers. And yep. one, one thing here is um, there's this problem where, you know, once a country has become very economic, once one country, the US or Britain has become very economically developed, countries, other countries have, again, like an existential incentive to develop the same technologies and to do so quickly. Sure. Um, and South Korea and Taiwan both developed their steel in industries under those kinds of conditions. But I don't think that's really disagreeing with what you're saying. Um, I no, just wanted and, to make that. Yeah. And I think that's, I think, look, it's one path, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's one path that leads to growth. The question is, does it lead to optimal growth? Does it lead to the greatest right. growth? And I would say South Korea and in Taiwan undermine their own people by not letting this happen organically and figuring out what the comparative advantage actually was and feeding off of that uh, comparative advantage. Yes, they became rich very quickly by copying, but is that instilled a, 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 in, society, in their societies? a uh, attitude of entrepreneurship, an attitude of innovation and ingenu in ingenuity. Uh, is, that, is that a system and a, a, and a mental attitude that is gonna sustain those cultures uh, you know, 100 years from now? Uh, they're gonna have to evolve pretty quickly away from that if they wanna really continue to grow because now they've copied everything there's to copy, now what? And yet mm -hmm. they haven't instilled the right attitude in their culture to develop the kind of things that can grow them beyond just copying. Um, I think Japan is is an example of a country that had it both. A lot of a lot of the innovation happened organically. Uh, you know, entrepreneurs like Honda and um, you, I forget the names, but the different entrepreneurs for the auto industry and the electronics industry. Yeah, they were supported at some point by the state, but it required entrepreneurial. It wasn't. And then the state did come in and said, "We need this and we need that." And usually, when the state said, "We need this and we need that," they failed. The petrochemical and drug industries in Japan are good examples of that. Uh, and yet Japan, because they didn't instill, they didn't support, they didn't encourage the individualism and the entrepreneurial culture that some Japanese had, that wasn't encouraged. That wasn't what was promoted, particularly in the 70s and 80s, as they got richer and more successful, they crashed. And uh, if you look at economic growth, um, if you look at economic growth over the last 20 or 30 years in Japan, 
it's basically flat because once they once they reached the full limits of the copy model, they hadn't instilled in their population the ability then to innovate beyond that, and now they're stuck. And it's sad to see Japan being stuck because they deserve, you know, they 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 have the capacity for so much more. Yes. Sorry. Uh, well, well, no, no, no. Um, actually, very quickly on that, have you thought much about what conditions, what the, or l let me rephrase, you know, why is it that in some parts of the world there is this innovative spirit? Um, like, how would you, I mean, it's probably very complicated. The, the true answer is, I'm sure, very complicated, but do you have any quick thoughts on that? It's got to do with, it's definitely got to do with culture. It's, mm -hmm. it's got to do with particular cultures and a, a particular focus on a desire to better oneself and, and a cultural view that that is a good thing, that betterment, that success is a positive thing. And, and you definitely had a shift in the West with the enlightenment away from acceptance of the status quo, a lack of threat, a lot of, a lot of energy towards uh, self betterment. Um, you, you know, Deirdre, Deirdre McCluskey, who I know, you know, you know, documents kind of the, the cultural shift towards, uh, towards an attitude of no success is good. You know, making money is good and, and achieving is good. And, and that happens in the 18th, early 19th century, but it starts kind of in, in Amsterdam in the, in maybe the 17th century, and it's slowly through, I think, primarily philosoph philosophers and social thinkers and, and business success and the wealth created in Amsterdam, that model starts spreading in the West and start being embraced. It, it existed in Greece, in ancient Greece, and, and to some extent in Rome. Uh, and it exists in China, at least to some extent. It, it, the mm -hmm. Chinese culture has that attitude of go get it, you know, go, go for it. And communism is an aberration in a sense that uh, historically China up to, a, up to, you know, has always advanced a lot, being very successful because of individual entrepreneurs and so on, then becomes authoritarian, crushes that, and then starts all over again and seems to go through these cycles throughout its history. So I guess maybe communism is not an aberration, it's the authoritarian instinct that crushes um, uh, entrepreneurship. But Chinese culture is very entrepreneurial. Western culture has been very entrepreneurial. I think the two ideas that allow the West to do it and have now been embraced by China and, and, and uh, in Asia, but historically China kind of got away without these ideas. So it's, it's interesting how they did it. Um, and the two ideas are basically the efficacy of the human mind, the efficacy of reason, the, 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 the negation of superstition, uh, mysticism uh, and and just mystical explanations of the world. So the elevation of science, but really it's the elevation of the human mind, the, 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 the efficacy of reason. And second is individualism, the sanctity of the individual, the importance of the individual and the ability of the individual to use his mind. Uh, this is Aristotle. So, so the West has benefited from the fact that we had Aristotle. Aristotle is the father of the entrepreneurial mind because he gives from a moral perspective, he assigns your moral responsibility, your happiness, your success as a human being. And he gives you the tools to be successful, i.e. logic and reason. And to the extent that Aristotle is the dominant attitude in a culture, to that extent, it's, it's, uh, it's entrepreneurial. And I think Asia's imported that attitude mm -hmm. into its culture. So, so uh, do, do you think that China and more generally East Asian countries are capable of innovation going forward? Like they're going to well, innovate in ways, like they're not just going to copy? Um, so it depends. China has shown some significant ability to innovate. Yeah. Uh, China's ahead in, in certain areas. China's ahead of the United States and ahead of the West uh, uh, in areas where they don't regulate and don't control, for example, fintech. Now, uh, but now that they started to regulate fintech and they they just broke up ants which is which is jack ma's uh, big mm -hmm. company maybe they'll stop innovating because the state will will start interfering and that's largely probably for authoritarian reasons absolutely like, so, right so the yeah. enemy of innovation is authoritarianism and so china is trying to straddle 
these two worlds. They're trying to embrace innovation right. in the private sector while at the same time have political oppression. Maintaining and control. Right? In a while, stepping <laughs> yeah. into the economic sector and shutting stuff down yeah. in an authoritarian way. And they can't have their cake and eat it too. One has to give. And so far, the authoritarian instinct is, is surpassing everything else. Um, Japan has shown signs that they can innovate. Uh, I think you're seeing that in other cultures. But look, the alternative to Korea and Taiwan is, is, a, is, is Hong Kong. Mm. Hong Kong had no industrial policy, does not have a steel industry, and yet per capita GDP is higher than both Taiwan and South Korea. They're richer than them in a sense. They, they, uh, they developed, uh, you know, and, and you could argue Singapore is somewhere in between, but probably more similar to Hong Kong than Taiwan and, uh, and uh, South Korea. And uh, both are richer, um, and uh, both started up poorer, um, and uh, were incredibly successful. So whenever somebody says, well, what does it take? I say, well, look at Hong Kong. What did Hong Kong have? Nothing. No natural resources uh, other than a port, um, but not much of a trading partner in, chi in communist China. Um, so what did, what did Hong Kong have? It had the rule of law, the protection of property rights. It had almost no regulations, almost no welfare state, almost no taxation. If any country adopts those with a culture that respects reason and in the individual and respects learning and education to some extent, it will be a successful, it will be successful. It might take it longer, a little bit longer in some places than others, but just seeing these things, these principles being adopted in Africa and the successful there when they are, maybe not to the extent yet of Hong Kong, but maybe one day. Mm -hmm. That's the model and that's the counterfactual. And if I would argue Korea would be richer and would have attained rich, uh, being rich faster if it adopted the Hong Kong model rather than the model they adopted. Let, me ask, one, that, right? let me ask one final question, which is kind of taking the conversation in a new direction, but just since I've got you. Um, I mean, one characteristic of the East Asian countries is that they're pretty, is that they're pretty mono-ethnic. And um, I think some argue um, it's a pretty common perception, especially on the right, that multi-ethnic societies are lower trust societies on average. And trust is really critical for the successful functioning of capitalism. Um, so what are your views on this? I mean, I, I assume you agree that societal trust is extremely important in order for capitalism to function well, but do you think that, do you take seriously the argument that that more ethnically homogeneous societies tend to have higher trust. And that might be a reason if you favor capitalism and want capitalism to work well, that you should tailor your immigration policy accordingly. No, and the, and, and, and the big counterfactual to that is the United States of America. And the big, and, and the big period there again is the 19th century where it was mm -hmm. very multi-ethnic by the standards of the time, right? Mm -hmm. In those days, Italians and Irish and Germans hated each other's guts and viewed each other as different ethnic groups as they did through World War II, if you will, right? Uh, uh, and, um, uh, and Jews and, uh, you know, Chinese, but of course there was, a lot of, there was a lot of racism towards the Chinese. And yet trust developed in the United States. And if you compare Europe to the United States in terms of trust, I mean, United States of the past, maybe not the United States of today. That state has like way more trust than in, 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 in the United States, you would do business on a handshake in the 19th century, early 20th century. You'd never do that in Europe. You'd never do that in Europe. Even in, in mono ethnic societies like Sweden that everybody touts as these wonderful examples. First of all, they're not that wonderful. America is richer, more successful than Sweden is by far. Um, and, and much more entrepreneurial and much more, uh, much more successful in, 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 in many, many respects. And yet it's multi-ethnic. Um, and and uh, Israel, I, I would argue, is a multi-ethnic society because Jews came from all over the world, bringing mm -hmm. very different ethnicities and cultures. And it's, it's a multi-ethnic society that's incredibly successful. Um, I don't know if, the, if, if in China, if, sorry, if in Hong Kong, they would consider it a mono-ethnic society. Mm -hmm. Hong mm -hmm. Kong has Brits uh, who are crucial. They have Chinese, but they have different Chinese uh, minorities. Yeah. They have mm -hmm. Cantonese and Mandarin. Mm -hmm. They also have Indians. 
they uh you know they have indonesians they they, 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 they you know they have filipino i mean it's a it's a multi-ethnic society by their standards maybe not by ours as western as we look at it oh they all look asians therefore they're monothe but that's ridiculous right is, um, is your guess is your guess that the united states will um over the course of the next two to three generations develop more cohesion and just right now we're going through a period of kind of ethnic tension and difference no ethnic tension is a consequence of lack of freedom and it's a consequence of bad ideas so ethnic tension is completely a consequence of 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 uh of the the mixed economy of the fact that we 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 had a mixed economy we had um uh, jim crow laws we had slavery those are violations of capitalism those are anti-capitalist institutions and they're anti-freedom institutions. And then we've had kind of reverse, we've had affirmative action, we've had a civil rights act that I think is, has a lot of flaws in it. And, and on top of that, we have bad ideas. We have ideas in the culture, both on the left and right, that support the idea that uh, different races think differently, different races have different values, that we, we have collectivized American society in unthinkable ways. Um, and it's it's getting worse, not better. So unless so, the only way we will shift back to a society of uh, that's more cohesive, and uh, is if we shift to more individualism. That's the funny thing: the more individualistic a society is, the more cohesive it is. Right. The more shared values you have, because we all we all want the freedom to pursue our own happiness. And if we realize that you're not pursuing your happiness at my expense. But we live under a system, and the system is built in a way to facilitate both of us pursuing our happiness as independent agents, that we're not stepping on each other's toes, that we're not, it's not a zero-sum game. That is the kind of society that, where you get cohesion and where we, you know, I think critical race theory right now is, is unbelievably destructive. Um, but but so was a, a lot of the kind of the, 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 the white supremacy that turned into... Western civilization supremacy, not in terms of culture, which I think it is superior, but associating a culture with race. And I see a lot of that on the right. You know, white people invented this and white people invented that. As long as we think in those terms, it's a it's a frigging disaster. Um, and so I think the solution is individualism and reason. And individualism and reason would view, view a proper view of individualism reason views racism as those more barbaric, stupid, uh, primitive form of collectivism, which is really, really bad already. And this is even dumber than that, right? Uh, we need to go back to individualism. That's what will bring cohesion in this country. I see no indication we're heading in that direction, sadly. Uh, if anything, COVID has, has, has made us more collectivist and made us more, and, and if, as it has shown that Americans are more mindless. Uh, Europe is moving in a more collectivistic direction. Um, I don't know where in the world is a, is a bright spot in terms of moving us towards individualism. I've dedicated my life to that fight, so it's it's pretty depressing to see that you know me losing, uh, you know or us losing, those of us who are in the fight. Um, but it but we are losing. There's no question, and it's it's uh, it is uh, yeah. It's it's difficult to watch. It's difficult to see. Well, I'm sorry to end on that <laughs> grim note, but and I really you know, appreciate it. doing exciting things. And I know, you know, you run the Mill Series, and I think the Mill Series, of course, is doing exciting things at a great college where, where smart kids go to study. And, and I'm sure it's having an impact on those kids because they're being exposed to a wide variety of ideas. And at the end of the day, that's what kids need to have that experience in college. And they're encouraged, I think, to think for themselves. That's the focus of things like the Mill Series. And we're seeing more and more of that kind yeah. of attitude in academia I, I still it's still small it's still yeah. but but, but it's there day, yeah. critical race theory is getting a lot of press yeah but i'm not sure it's as dominant as people think it is yeah. versus the mill series that probably has a lot of impact on young kids but he's getting no right he's yeah. getting no press right so i'm as much as i'm pessimistic there's a sense in which i'm optimistic yeah. because i do yeah. think we're making inroads my critical race theory and the pervasiveness of it just shows how much a small committed minority can achieve but yes well, I agree with you. but they can achieve it only because the culture is prepped for it right mm -hmm. and what we um, need yeah. is to work on prepping the culture for, for for better ideas 
And I think we, I think ultimately we will be successful because ultimately our ideas are the right ideas. And, and I think human beings ultimately want to be successful. They want to be happy. They want to flourish. They want to be wealthy. They want to progress. And therefore they will get, they, you know, once at some point they, you know, they, they will gravitate towards a better philosophy, a better set of ideas that actually allows for that. Well, that is a better note to end on. <laughs> it was great to see you, Iran. Thanks so much for doing so, this. Thanks, Brandon. And, and, you know, let, let me know if there's anything I can, uh, I can do with the uh, Mill series. It, it was fun. That debate was fun and it's still getting huge numbers of views online. No, it was great. And uh, people honestly particularly enjoyed seeing you in person. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch again soon, I'm sure. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Good. You take care. Brandon. Bye. Bye. And